What if P.J. Walker is the answer long-term at quarterback here in Carolina? And Steve Wilkes, he's done a really good job so far as the Panthers interim. Should he have the interim tag removed and be named the head coach right now? Those are some of the questions I'll answer on this week's edition of the Weekly Friday Mailbag on Locked On Panthers. You are Locked On Panthers, your daily Carolina Panthers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into another edition of the Locked On Panthers podcast, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, as always, Julian Council, talking Carolina Panthers with you every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And of course, every Sunday following a Panthers game on our live show over on our Locked On Panthers YouTube channel. Be sure to watch the show and subscribe to the show over there now so you don't miss out on Sunday's episode. And if you ever miss out on a live episode on Locked On Panthers YouTube channel, it's okay. You can always find it in the podcast stream later. You can also listen to every single episode of Locked On Panthers wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. And be sure to follow me, Julian Council, on Twitter at Julian Council, where every single Friday, like today, I answer your weekly Friday mailbag questions here on the show to participate in next week's edition of the weekly Friday mailbag, which we probably won't have because the Panthers play on Thursday. So we'll have to figure out what we're going to do with the mailbag. Did not think about that before recording. But the answer to getting questions for the next mailbag that we do, just be sure to at me or DM me on Twitter at Julian Council. But again, first, make sure to follow me on Twitter at Julian Council. Today's episode of Locked On Panthers is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. And I don't think I have really any more thoughts going to this game on Sunday other than the Carolina Panthers need to get after Joe Burrow. He leads the league right now in passing yardage. He's also been sacked more times than almost every quarterback in the NFL except for one. The Bengals offensive line, especially the tackles, have not been good this year. And the Panthers pass rush really hasn't been great. As I said on Thursday's crossover episode with James Rapine, the Panthers are 20th in ESPN's pass rush win rate. They need to be better. Brian Burns, has five of the team's 12 sacks. That's just not going to do it. Burns will likely have double-digit sacks this season, but someone needs to step up. We have not seen it from Marquise Haynes. Haven't really seen it from Itor Grosmatos. Damian Wilson, the free agent from Jacksonville last year who plays linebacker for the Panthers, he's second in the team with two. They need to find some other help at the edge rusher spot. They didn't do that going into the season with guys like Carlos Dunlap deciding to go elsewhere. And of course, they didn't do that trade deadline. The Carolina Panthers have to have guys step up over the next nine weeks if they're going to find a way to be better at getting after the passer. And they certainly need to do that on Sunday against Joe Burrow and the Bengals, even though Jamar Chase is not out there healthy right now to get Joe Burrow off his spot because he's a gamer. If you watch him play back at LSU, you watch him play in Cincinnati, especially last year on the way to the Super Bowl, that dude can kill you. So the Panthers banged up secondary, need some help from Brian Burns and the rest of his friends that are on the defensive line to get after the passer on Sunday afternoon and to be able to capitalize against what's been a very bad offensive line, which is surprising considering the Bengals, much like the Panthers, spent a lot of assets to try and fix that unit. The Panthers did it. The Bengals did not do it. So the Carolina Panthers, key to victory on Sunday, get after Joe Burrow. All right, let's get into it. The weekly Friday mailbag here on Locked on Panthers. Again, like I said earlier, if you want to participate in the next mailbag, either at me or DM me on Twitter at Julian Council. Let's start off with this question about PJ Walker. Uh, this person's name, they didn't give me their real name. Again, guys, give me your real name if you're going to DM me. Um, and I can't necessarily see what their name is on Twitter because I don't think that would be uh, kosher. So going to go on with the question now. What if PJ is that guy? He's been showing his talent and chemistry with this team. He's made some clutch third down passes. He had the highest QBR in the Tampa Bay game. And then shakes off an interception to keep us in the game with the best pass of the NFL season per Patrick Mahomes to tie the game against Atlanta. I've always thought PJ looked great when given the opportunity, albeit he's had some streakiness and some struggles of interceptions. Do you think we give him the chance next year if he continues to play like this? If he continues playing at this level, do we use the first round on a quarterback or fill other holes like tight end, another edge rusher, linebacker, defensive tackle, wide receiver? Please, God, don't waste it on a running back. Do we roll with PJ and Matt Corral? I feel like it's not a bad plan, but I feel like the pressure, focus, and court of public opinion opinion will force our hand on a quarterback I just don't get it look at the top quarterbacks over the last few years nobody has panned out where expected sorry for the long message keep it the awesome work love the show and keep pounding yes keep pounding as well listener whose name will be uh, to be determined later a lot of questions in there 
really the main question is what if PJ's the guy? Um, if PJ's the guy, then that is awesome news for the Carolina Panthers. They would have spent what a second, fourth, and sixth round pick on Sam Darnold and a conditional fifth round pick on Baker Mayfield and then traded up. I'm giving away a sixth round pick and that year's third round pick or fourth round pick to get Matt Corral. They would have spent a lot of capital to get a quarterback. And none of those guys ended up being the guy, except for the guy who was free, cost nothing other than just the money and the salary cap, and that being P.J. Walker. I think it would be excellent news if P.J. Walker is the guy. I don't think it's or I don't I think it's too early, though, to say that he is the guy. He's had two good performances after they showed no faith in him on the road against the Rams, looked excellent against Tampa Bay, as you mentioned, had the highest QBR that week in the NFL last week, wasn't great in the first half but came back in the second half, lit it up, had the pass of the season per Patrick Mahomes, who was the NFL Mahomes, and PJ, as I've dubbed him, was the XFL Mahomes. And PJ's looked good. He's had his issues with turnovers. And last week's pick six, Steve Wilkes said it on Monday, you can't really place it on PJ because the offensive lineman didn't do his job, the running back didn't do his job, and of course, PJ didn't necessarily do his job either, but it wasn't all on PJ. I, thought, I think so far, PJ's shown that he is the guy who's going to help the Panthers win moving forward. Now, it's also a week-to-week basis. I think he'll start, of course, on Sunday. And I think he'll start on next Thursday against the Falcons, considering it's a short week. And we'll see what happens with Sam Darnold and Baker Mayfield. I don't think Baker starts another game for this team unless PJ and Sam are injured. It's possible that Sam Darnold starts. But if PJ continues to play the way he's playing, then, yeah, you're going to have to have the conversation of, is this the guy? Because here's the thing. It's not just if PJ is good enough to be a starting quarterback in the NFL, which he might be able to prove. At the very least, I think he'll prove, like what Taylor Heineke has proven, in Washington, that he is a high-level backup who can help you win games if you need him for four or five, six, who even knows how many weeks you need him. He can go out there and win games for you. Matt Rule didn't believe that last year. That's why he brought in Cam Newton. So far, one and two, but games that where they've actually tried to win with P.J. being P.J., they're one and one. So we'll see what happens the rest of the way. It would be great. At the end of the day, though, what is David Tepper looking for here in Carolina? That quarterback that can help them hoist the Lombardi Trophy. Do you think P.J. Walker is that guy? It doesn't have to just be a quarterback. The rest of the team and the roster has to be in a position to where the Carolina Panthers can win a Super Bowl. But do you think you can win a Super Bowl with P.J. Walker? If you don't think you can win a Super Bowl with P.J. Walker, then yeah, you draft the quarterback there in the first round. And the best way to try and find a quarterback in the NFL is by drafting in the first round at the top of the draft. It's a crapshoot. I agree with you. It's not as simple as, hey, you draft a quarterback in the first round and your team's going to be good. If it was that simple, then everybody in the NFL would have a quarterback. And nowadays, we're asking quarterbacks or NFL teams are asking quarterbacks to do more than they've ever had to do before. Look at what Josh Allen does to carry that Bills offense. Look at Patrick Mahomes, what he does. You can't ask random, you can't ask Sam Darnold to do that. You can't even ask her cousins, who's been a top 10 quarterback and who Vikings fans want to move off of because they want a better guy, but it's not as simple as upgrading from a Kirk cousin. You can't ask Jimmy Garoppolo and some of these players to do the things that Kansas City and Andy Reid's asking Patrick Mahomes that that's being asked of Josh Allen up in Buffalo. It's just not feasible to ask some of these players to do it, but yet that's what we're asking from the quarterback position nowadays. What they need is someone to come in here, stabilize position, but for Tepper, he wants someone who can win him a Super Bowl. So until they can find that guy and someone shows that promise, they're going to keep going out there and trying to find a quarterback. It would be great if they feel like PJ's that guy, because then, yes, you can get a Will Anderson. You can go out there and get an edge rusher. You can get some of these other players that are coming in the draft that are maybe a wide receiver, like a Jackson Smith, a Jingba, who's not been healthy at Ohio State, but still is an excellent player. You can go out there and get those kind of players, opposed to being like, all right, let's get a quarterback cross your fingers and hope to God he's the right player. I do not think with a new head coach because comes in this year or next year, I don't think there's going to be a scenario where PJ and Matt Corral are the two quarterbacks on the roster. I do think the Carolina Panthers will bring somebody else. I don't think if there's a new head coach, he's definitely going to roll with PJ and Matt Corral. Now there's a possibility, I guess this would be a scenario where it could happen if Steve Wilkes retains the job and then he decides, okay, PJ, you're my guy. Matt Corral, of course, was drafted. And then of course I got to bring someone in, you know, just to work out. Maybe they bring back Jacob Eason. Of course, Sam and Baker will be gone. So there's that scenario. But really, I think at the end of the day, the Panthers are just not going to be a good enough team. They're going to be at the top of the draft. And when you're at the top of the draft, they're going to look at Bryce Young and look at CJ Stroud. They're going to look at Hendon Hooker. They're going to look at Will Levis. And they're going to say to themselves, all right, let's give that guy an opportunity on, on a rookie contract and let him be our guy. Or they could just wait, have PJ do it again next season, but it depends on who's the head coach. If it's a different head coach, PJ's not the starter. If it's still, if it's still Steve Wilkes, then there's a possibility that PJ's the starter. 
but we'll see if he's the guy. He still has nine games to prove that he is and to tell the Panthers, hey, guys, don't draft somebody else. Improve the roster, roll with me next season, and we'll see where it goes. So I don't know, but um, we'll see. All right, over to Nathan. Hypothetical question for the Friday mailbag. If the Jags offered Trevor Lawrence for the second overall pick, do you think the Panthers should take it? Um, no, I think this is a simple financial question. So Trevor Lawrence is in his second year. Uh, Bill Barnwell at ESPN.com did a really good breakdown of all these second year starting quarterbacks like Davis Mills in Houston, where that's not working out. They're going to have to go get a quarterback at the top of the draft. We're looking at Zach Wilson in New York, who's held back the Jets at this point in time. Like they've won in spite of him, not because of him outside of that fourth quarter in Pittsburgh. Uh, there's questions about whether he should have been benched last week in favor of Mike White. And Joe Flacco's looked better than him this season when Joe Flacco filled in when he was down with the knee injury earlier in the year. Then, of course, there's Trevor Lawrence, there's Justin Field, too. Right at this moment in time, looks like the best of those guys. And, of course, Mac Jones, who for a period of time had lost his job to Bailey Zappi on a Monday night where they got the brakes be beat off of him by Justin Fields and those exact same beers. But really, okay, Lawrence, he's been okay. He has Doug Peterson now. We'll see how it, how it pans out. Because the thing is, you want to see that improvement starting year two. You have really until year three to know whether they're the guy because at that point in time, you have to pick up the fifth-year option. So the Panthers traded for Trevor Lawrence. They would have him going in his third year, and then you would have to figure out after that year whether you want to keep him for two one season plus one because he'll be there for his fourth season. But after that, are you going to have his fifth-year option or not? So it makes more sense to draft a rookie, have them start on that rookie deal, and then you have three years – to wait and see whether they're the guy opposed to with Trevor, you have one season to figure out whether he is or not. It's just, you want to reset the clock. You don't want to be picking up a quarterback in the middle of their clock. Like we saw with Sam Darnold when the Panthers hadn't had him on the roster for his first three seasons and immediately decided to justify giving up those three picks that they had to pick up his fifth year option to show faith in Sam. And also they felt like, Hey, $22 million over two years. That makes sense. Until you look at like, okay, it's four last year. Now it's 18, nearly $19 million this season. It was very prohibitive for the Carolina Panthers to find a way to build this roster. And that's why they have so much dead money going into next season because of the restructured deals they had to do because of the mistake that they brought in Sam Darnold. So no, hypothetically, if Trevor Lawrence was available, no, the Carolina Panthers need to draft their own guy instead of trying to do the, once again, the reclamation project of a first round pick, even though I won't say that right now about Trevor Lawrence, considering he's only in the, what, eight games through his second year in the NFL. Okay, let me take a quick pause here on the show, then I'll come back and answer more of your weekly Friday mailbag questions here on Locked on Panthers. This episode of Locked on Panthers is brought to you by Prediction Strike, the world's first sports stock market. You can now invest in professional athletes just like stocks. It's a lower risk alternative to sports betting and athlete prices move based on performance and supply and demand. For example, if you invested in Jalen Hurts one year ago, you'd be up 48.2%. All athletes benefit too and are entitled to percentage of their market cap. You can invest in four sports, not just the NFL, but the UFC, NBA, and Major League Baseball. Download the Prediction Strike Strike app and use code LOCKED for a free share when you sign up and make a first deposit of $20 or more. That's promo code LOCKED for a special one-time giveaway. Prediction Strike will choose one person who signs up with code LOCKED and makes a deposit to win 100 free random shares. That could be worth up to $3,000 if you get lucky and receive Josh Allen shares. Invest in what you know on Prediction Strike, the stock market for sports. Can we pause the pod for a second? Okay, we're paused. Great, because you got to try this. I'm talking about Built Bar's new reimagined flavors. Cookie dough topper, coconut brownie bar, coconut brownie topper, white chocolate peppermint granola. It's built take on a granola bar. It's so more filling, and it's still insanely tasty. And they also have candy cane brownie puff. Built Puffs are like biting into the universe's most delicious cloud. First off, for anyone who hasn't tried Built Bars before, they're literally the best tasting protein bars ever built. They're revolutionizing nutrition as we know it with 100% real chocolate, 17 grams of protein and shockingly low sugar and calories, 130 calories. That's all there is in Built Bars. Just sink your teeth in the first bite and it will change your life forever. I'm not kidding. There will be a time before you try these new Built Bars and the magical, wonderful time afterwards. You're probably wondering which new flavor is my favorite. It's an unanswerable question to say the least. They're all unbelievable and they are all different. So you can order a mix box and try all five flavors for yourself built you gotta try this get 15 percent off your order right now by using promo code lock 15 at built.com 
Okay, let's get back to your weekly Friday mailbag questions here on Locked on Panthers. Over to Willie now, who asks, now that we have seen all the trade deadline madness unfold, do you think we got fair compensation for Christian McCaffrey? So the Panthers traded Christian McCaffrey, what, four, no, yeah, yeah, 14 days ago now. Uh, 14 or about uh, 15. Yeah, 15 days ago. They traded Christian McCaffrey for a second third and fourth round pick in 2023 and a fifth round pick in 2024. And as I broke it down on that show, fifth rounder, that basically makes up for the Baker Mayfield trade. Um, the third rounder in this upcoming year in 2023 makes up for the trade to Jacksonville that brought you CJ Henderson. And now you have an extra second and an extra fourth. And what the Panthers wanted was a first rounder or the equivalent of a first rounder. So apparently according to that chart that, you know, tells you what it is and what it is not, they were just right there on the threshold of a first round pick. And I think the, what the Carolina Panthers need is more ammo in this upcoming year's draft that now have two second round picks, have two fourth round picks to get your third round pick back after trading that away to New England or to New England, not New England, to um, Jacksonville. I think it's smart that the Carolina Panthers made that trade. And I do think they got fair compensation for Christian McCaffrey. He's an excellent player. We've already seen that with the three touchdowns, rushing, passing, and receiving in the game on Sunday with the 49ers win. But we also saw that without him, Deontay Foreman's emerged and turned out to be a pretty damn good player. So, yeah, I think they got fair compensation for Christian McCaffrey. Um, Sam also has a Christian McCaffrey question. He asked, do you think the team was too McCaffrey-centric when he was in Carolina, and now that he's gone, the offense is free to operate with all its available pieces, keeping defenses guessing more often? Yeah, certainly that's uh, there's a case to be made for that. Defenses are going to have trouble – stopping Deontay Foreman late in games because he's such a big presence and he's been compared to Derrick Henry is he he's not Derrick Henry obviously but he's a good player and we've seen over the last two weeks especially last Sunday with his three touchdowns on the road against Atlanta that guy can be a lead back he was a lead back last year in Tennessee as I brought up he's a good player Chris McCaffrey's a great player he's excellent if Chris McCaffrey hadn't been injured the last two years he would easily be on his way to the Hall of Fame and my hope is he stays healthy and San Francisco has success, and one day will become a Hall of Famer. I don't think Deontay Foreman is going to be that unless he just goes berserk the rest of his career. Christian's already done something that only two other players have done with the 1,000-1,000 season. Marshall Falk, who's already in the Hall of Fame, and Roger Craig, who, a former 49er, arguably should be in the Hall of Fame as well. So Christian's just one of those guys who's just different. But it does allow the Panthers to be more creative and not to have to lean on McCaffrey as much as they used to. And hell, he's a great player, makes makes a lot of plays, but now you have Deontay Foreman involved. Now you get to see what Chuba Hubbard can do as long as he's not asked to catch the football at the backfield. And Terrace Morris has gotten involved. I think that's probably a bigger part of Robbie Anderson not being here. So yeah, it's, a, it's forced him to have to be way more creative than to sit there and lean on Christian the entire game. That's absolutely an astute observation, in my opinion, Sam. All right, let's go over to Clayton now. He asked, do you think that Steve Wilkes will only get a look to be hired based off of his wins and losses? Because after watching the past three games, this is the most fight I've seen in the Panthers team since 2017, which, of course, was the last time the Panthers went to the playoffs. Oh, that's tough. Because when you look at it, he's not necessarily in a great position to win football games. Now with P.J. Walker at quarterback, that position seems to be in much better hands than it was in the first five weeks when Matt Rule was here with Baker Mayfield. And now Wilkes did, in a way, throw away the Rams game because he didn't allow P.J. Walker to even be P.J. Walker. And we saw how that cost him offensively. And in a way, I kind of understood it, but he did say last week, everything comes of time. And me spending more time with P.J. and seeing more of P.J. with the first-team offense has allowed me to be more confident and comfortable in allowing P.J. Walker to go out there and be himself. So we saw how that panned out against the Buccaneers. We saw how it almost panned out. I mean, BJ wasn't the reason why they lost that game on Sunday against Atlanta. Uh, but he's got to win games, though, man. It's about, win it's about wins and losses. Like Matt Rule, those guys, they played hard for him, supposedly. And I think, yes, we've seen a little bit more energy from them. I mean, a lot. I don't want to say a lot more because these guys, it's not like the Browns game, they weren't competitive. It's not like the Giants game, they weren't, they weren't competitive. Like, they've been competitive. The only game where we had seen them just get their doors blown off of them was San Francisco, which coincidentally was the last game we ever saw Matt Rule as head coach of the Carolina Panthers. So yeah, they're playing their ass off for Steve Wilkes. Absolutely. And it's not like these guys haven't played hard, but it just feels different. And, and I agree with you there. And I think that's kind of the point that you're trying to make. It does feel different. Steve Wilkes has the experience of being a head coach in the NFL. He did not get a fair shake in Arizona. He has experience of being here in Carolina and knowing what it takes to win. 
And because of that connection that he has, not only have been here as a secondary coach and defensive coordinator back when Ron Rivera was the head coach, but also being from here and understanding what this team means to the community, of course, what it means to him. So I would love for him to get the job, but Steve Wilkes can't have his team be like four and 13 and end up with a head coaching guy. I just don't think that's going to happen. It's important to show the leadership and it would be great if he can like, you know, get the seven wins and then he can be like, Hey, look, I won seven. I won six games here in the final would have been, that would be what 12 games. So we'd gone 500. If he goes 500, then I don't see how David Tepper can, can look at that man in the face and be like, you aren't a hell of a coach. You don't deserve this job. So we'll see. I, I hope it happens. I just, I still think that David Tepper is going to lean on getting someone else who has an offensive background and that's just uh, the trends and, We'll see what happens. Now over to Clay. Um, he asked another Steve Wilkes question. If Steve Wilkes does get the job as head coach next season, do you see him making any big changes in the coaching staff? Would he keep Ben McAdoo or bring in his own guy? He'd bring in his own guy. There'd be a lot of people that would be gone. Like Al Holcomb would still be here. Um, and then looking at the defensive staff, I would imagine someone like Evan Cooper. Well, he's not a defensive staff. Well, yeah, he, yeah, he is. Evan Cooper. He's probably going, I don't know if he stays in the NFL, but he's a rule guy. So he'd probably be gone at some point in time, depends. But he would make a lot of changes on this staff and he would want to bring in his own guys because that's just what people do. So no, Ben McAdoo would not be back here as the OC. This is Ben McAdoo's last chance to be an OC. And as we've seen, it has not gone well and it's unfortunate for him, but I'm sure he had an idea that this was likely to happen when he decided to take the job. But he wanted to take the job to give him an opportunity to show the rest of the league, like, hey, I can still be an OC. So, yeah, if Steve Wilkes gets a job, Al Holcomb will be the DC. Will everybody else return? I don't know. We'd love to see Chris Tabor stay as special teams coordinator. But there would definitely be a massive turnover on the offensive side. I would hope James Campen would stay as well. But um, there would be a lot of changes throughout the building. And that's going to be the case whether Steve Wilkes is the head coach or they bring someone else in. Like, not everyone's going to get retained, which is what I said to y'all. Yeah, you want to fire a rule, which is totally fine, but I understand you're going to lose a lot of people. Like, people were like, hey, we love Bill Snow. Bill Snow's a rule guy. He's gone. So there will be other casualties along the way. We'll see how it pans out later on. Okay, I'll take one more quick pause, and I'll come back here and answer more of your weekly Friday mailbag questions here on Locked on Panthers. But first, a message from our friends over at LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. It's so easy to create a free job post on LinkedIn Jobs. And once you do, make sure to add the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. Simple tools like screen questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs help you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free terms and conditions apply okay let's keep going here on the weekly friday mailbag on locked on panthers again either at me or dm me on twitter at julian council over now to harrison who uh, lives in nashville and i don't know if he still is running the uh roaring riots i guess the music city riot chapter over there in nashville but if he is go check him out Throughout the season, go watch some of the games there with him and the Music City Riot. I used to do that when I lived in Nashville. Harrison, great guy. Uh, but he says, since I live in Nashville, I got to see a lot of Deontay Foreman last season when he filled in during Derrick Henry's injury and saw a ton of potential. Matt Rule slash Ben McAdoo rarely used him earlier this season, especially on third downs that Foreman could have played a key role in. Based on his performance in the last two weeks, is it just another indicator that Rule wasn't making the right personnel decisions? And what does that say about McAdoo as an OC? Yeah, McAdoo's not a great OC. We know that. But also, like, they had Christian McCaffrey on the roster. They were spending a ton of money on Christian McCaffrey. And just the politics of the NFL, you're not going to give a ton. You're not going to give the same amount of carries to Deontay Foreman as you are going to give to the guy you're paying $16 million a year and the man who has had a 1,000,000 season. And when is healthy, is the best, arguably the best running back in the NFL. Like, that's just how it is. Like, if Deontay Foreman was still playing in Tennessee, He's not getting to split carries 50-50 with Derrick Henry. It's probably like 80-20 at best because you don't want to take the ball to Derrick Henry's 
hands to allow a lesser version of Derrick Henry to play. Now, you can question, okay, like Foreman's out here making plays. Like, why couldn't we have done this before? Like, certainly, I guess there's definitely an argument that he deserved more carries. But Christian McCaffrey's Christian McCaffrey, y'all. Like, the dude is a stud. And I'm not saying that Foreman's not. Foreman a, is a really good player, as we've seen. He's capable, more than capable. Does it is it an indictment on Rule? It is weird that Matt Rule said that they want to have more of a downhill rushing attack. And then we had the third down. I can't remember what. I think it was the Arizona game. You had like a third and one and a fourth and one. And at no point was Deontay Foreman on the field. Why not? Like that's an indictment on Rule and Ben McAdoo that in those situations where at the goal line, in short yardage, when you would – think Foreman would be in the football game. He wasn't in the football game. So that's what I had questioned more so than did he get enough touches back when McCaffrey was here? Cause like, no McCaffrey deserves the touches because it's Christian McCaffrey, but those short yard, those short yarded situations that that didn't make any sense. And the justification also for what Matt rule had to say afterwards, as we saw was just absurd. All right, let's go over to Kurt now. Who's not happy about the defensive performance on Sunday in Atlanta last year against Washington and this year at Atlanta. Those are two games where the team has possibly season changing momentum on its side heading into the game and the offense plays well enough in the actual game to win. So those are both games. The defense has to ensure we win in both times. They had complete meltdowns. Great defenses don't have bad games in those situations. I love a lot about our defense, but if they're going to be great. They can't lose the Heineke at home and Mariota without Patterson and Ridley. A lot is made from the DJ catch, but when we go up 28 to 24 with three minutes left, the D cannot let Demir Bird touchdown drive happen that easily. Your thoughts? Yeah, I don't necessarily disagree with you. I, I don't really want to get too upset with the defense considering that, I mean, they're the main reason the Panthers even ever have a chance to win any games. The Panthers are even in games at the end to have an opportunity to come back and win, which of course they've never done um, the last three years. So, yeah, you you can't give up those plays. Like, C.J. Henderson, what are you doing there? They did make a play in overtime to position the offense to go out there and and, and win the game. Of course, uh, we saw the missed field goal from Eddie Pinheiro. So, I understand where you're coming from. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to lose a Heineke. You don't want to lose Mariota. It's 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 a tough situation. But that there's so many plays that happen to where – the Panthers make that like if DJ makes that catch on on fourth and 19. If if he doesn't, you know, throw his helmet and doesn't get penalized and all that kind of stuff, then we're not even having the conversation. But yeah, there have been times where the Panthers have needed the defense to get off the field throughout the last three seasons, and they have not gone off the field in a timely manner. And that's cost the Carolina Panthers time on the clock and also potentially cost them the game. But overall, the offense has just been so poor to where when they actually play well, I don't really think we can sit here and be like, wow, defense, way to go. You let us down this time. Um, okay, let's go to uh, William. He said, of the current top five or six quarterbacks available in the 2023 draft, which one do you think has the worst supporting cast? Uh, CJ and Young uh, both have good talent and coaches around them, which probably has more to do with their success than most will admit. With the high failure rate of number one, number two overall quarterbacks, I'm not sold on either one of these guys. Uh, thanks as always, and keep pounding. Um, well, yeah, obviously, CJ Strato, Ohio State, has great talent around him. He hasn't even had his best receiver, and they've still been one of the best offenses in college football. Bryce Young plays at Alabama, so yeah, he has plenty of talent around him. Uh, Will Levis even. I mean, Tavion Robinson, who's a transfer from Virginia Tech, has been good. Uh, the freshman Dane Key has been really good for him, and he has Chris Rodriguez as his running back, who since he came back in that Ole Miss game has been stellar. So he's got plenty of talent or plenty of talent around him. Um, I guess the other Hendon Hooker. I mean, God, have you watched? He's been doing this. Jalen Hyatt stepped up and been their top receiver when Cedric Tillman's been out with the tightrope surgery in his ankles. So they all have plenty of talent around them. Like no guy in college who's going to be considered like a first round pick does not have good talent around them. Like Sam, let's look at Sam Howell last year at Carolina when they're talking about, Hey, it could be a first round pick. And then he loses four guys on his offense in the skill position players to the NFL. Didn't look quite the same, even though statistically Howell didn't have that bad of a season, but it didn't look the same because he didn't have NFL talent around him. So when you have NFL talent around you, which all these guys have, then yeah, you look good. And I wouldn't be sold on any of these players because we have no idea. As you said, the high failure rate of number one, number two picks. It's a crapshoot. The hope is you bring them in here, you have the right infrastructure, you get town around them, and they succeed. That's what you got to hope. But the Jets are doing that right now with Josh or with, uh, Zach Allen or Zach Wilson, and it's not working out. Okay, last question from Mark. Staying in the spirit of Halloween week. Um, okay. Why do you think Shai Smith has been cast for the ghost? And why has Richard Higgins been the invisible man? And what was your Halloween costume? I don't like Halloween, so I did not celebrate. 
Um, and also, Shai Smith, yeah, I don't know, man. He looked great in the preseason, had a good report, Baker, and it just has not carried over. He struggled with drops. He's also, what, he was a fifth-round pick or sixth-round pick, whatever it was, in 2021 out of South Carolina. I, that's just kind of what comes with it. Like, And we've seen Terrace Marshall stepped up and played well, so hopefully Shai can play better. Rashard Higgins, I, I don't know what happened there, man. Um, you thought with Baker being here, that would work out. Of course, Baker's not in the starting quarterback anymore. wasn't any good when he was playing. Um, but, you know, the one time he was on the field, he fumbled. So you don't want to put a player who was not getting any reps and then goes out there and, and fumbles the ball, whether it was his fault or Baker's fault, you or whoever it was, you don't give him another opportunity. So that's what I'd say about that. Okay, so that's going to wrap up this edition of the Lockdown Panthers podcast, a part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. I'm your host, as always, Julian Council. Again, guys, make sure to watch our show and subscribe to the show over on our Locked On Panthers YouTube channel, where again on Sunday, following the game against the Bengals, I'll be going live from that channel. If you ever miss a live show, that's okay. You can always check us out wherever you listen to your podcast, where you can find the live episodes in every episode of Locked On Panthers there. And be sure to follow me on Twitter at Julian Council, where typically on Fridays, I answer weekly Friday mailbag questions, either at me or DM me to participate in the next Friday mailbag. We won't have one next week because of the Carolina Panthers game against the Atlanta Falcons on Thursday night, and Friday's show will be reacting to that game. So likely we'll do a Monday mailbag coming out of that game that I can do for y'all on that Monday morning. So stay tuned for more of an update on where our plans are. But in the meantime, be safe, be happy, be whole as always. Keep pounding, and I'll talk to you all on Sunday.